Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard, for that beautiful introduction. Uh, yeah, Richard picked me up hitchhiking. Um, he, he's been kind enough to forget this, and I uh, drove him crazy with questions about Gilbert and Sullivan for the whole way that he drove me, I think, to Pittsfield. But uh, anyway, he's been a wonderful friend, and I'm extremely grateful for that introduction. I'm also grateful for this invitation to speak to you. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's really extraordinarily exciting for me, and uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I'm going to start off, I think, by reading just a little bit of the book. Um, you know, I was thinking that I'd just wing it and just talk and, you know, be, be easy about things, and I, and I, I will. I'll, I'll calm down and I'll be fine. But uh, 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 as I was coming up here, I was thinking that, you know, the, the book actually begins with a trip to Boston from my hometown of Storrs, Connecticut. Uh, where, which is where I grew up from 1962 to 75. Um, and uh, I was thinking that um, tomorrow my son, William, is going to take me from Boston to stores, and it's, it's going to be fun to make the return visit. But I thought I'd read from the, the prologue to Parallel Play, which some of you may um, remember from the New Yorker article, which I did a couple years back. Uh, but it, it, it seems perfect for tonight um, because it's all about uh, Route 44 and uh, going or coming from Boston. So here we go. My second grade teacher never liked me much, and one assignment I turned in annoyed her so extravagantly that the red pencil with which she scrawled, See Me, broke through the lined paper. Our class had been asked to write about a recent field trip, and as was so often the case in those days, I had noticed the wrong things. And this is my paper. Well, we went to the Boston, Massachusetts through the town of Warrenville, Connecticut on Route 44A. It was very pretty, and there was a church that reminded me of pictures of Russia from our book that is published by Time Life. We arrived in Boston at 917. At 11, we went on a big tour of Boston on Gray Line 43, made by the Superior Bus Company, like School Bus 6, which goes down Hunting Lodge Road, where Maria lives, and then on to Separatist Road, and then to South Eagleville before it comes to our school. We saw lots of good things, like the Boston Massacre site. The tour ended at 105. Before I knew it, we were going home. We went through Warrenville again, but it was too dark to see much. <laughs> Um, it's an unconventional but hardly unobservant report. In truth, I cared not one bit about Boston on that windy spring day in 1963. Instead, I wanted to learn about Warrenville, a village a few miles northeast of the township of Mansfield, Connecticut, where my family was then living. I had memorized the map of Mansfield, available for one dollar from our municipal office, and I knew all the school bus routes by heart, a litany that I sang out to anybody I could corner. Um, but Warrenville was in the town of Ashford, for which I had no guide. And I remember my blissful sense of resolution when I verified that Route 44A crossed Route 89 in the town center, for I had long hypothesized that they might meet there. Of such joys and pains was my childhood composed. I received a grade of unsatisfactory in social development from the Mansfield Public Schools that year. I did not work to the best of my ability, did not show neatness and care in assignments, did not cooperate with the group, and did not exercise self-control. About the only positive assessment was that I worked well independently. <laughs> of course, that was all that I could do. Um, in the years since the phrase became a cliché, I have received any number of compliments for my supposed ability to think outside the box. Actually, it's been a struggle for me to perceive just what those boxes were, why they were there, why other people regarded them as important, where their borderlines might be, how to live safely within and without them. My efforts have only partly succeeded. At the age of 53, I am left with a melancholy sensation that my life has been spent in a perpetual state of parallel play, alongside but distinctly apart from the rest of humanity. From early childhood, my memory was so acute and my wit so bleak that I was described as a genius by my parents, by neighbors, and even on occasion by the same teachers who handed me failing marks. 
I wrap myself in this mantle, of course, as a poetic justification for behavior that might otherwise have been judged unhinged. And I did my best to believe in it, but the explanation made no sense. Although I delighted in younger children whom I could instruct and gently dominate and exulted when I ran across an adult who was willing to discuss my pet subjects, I could establish no connections with most of my classmates. My pervasive childhood memory is an excruciating awareness of my own strangeness. And so, between the ages of 7 and 15, I was given glucose tolerance tests, anti-seizure medications, electroencephalograms, and an occasional Mogadon tablet to shut me down at night. Anyone else remember Mogadon? It was, it was big. Um, I suffered through a summer of Bible camp. Exercise r regimens were begun and abandoned. The school brought its own psychiatrist to grill me once a week. Somehow every June, I was promoted to the next grade, having accomplished little to deserve it. Meanwhile, the more kindly teachers, recognizing that I would be tormented on the playground, permitted me to spend recess periods indoors, where I memorized vast portions of the 1961 edition of the World Book Encyclopedia, simply by skimming through its volumes. And in my darker moods, I think my life can be quickly summarized. I grew up and into other preoccupations, some of which served me well without ever managing to admit the full tide of human experience. I was told I had Asperger's syndrome in the fall of 2000 as part of what had become a protracted effort to identify and, if possible, alleviate my lifelong unease. I'd never heard of the condition, which had been recognized by the American Psychiatric Association only six years earlier. Nevertheless, the diagnosis was one of those rare clinical confirmations met mostly with relief. Here, finally, was an objective explanation for some of my strengths and weaknesses, the simultaneous capacity for unbroken work and all-encompassing recall, linked inextricably to a driven, uncomfortable personality. And I learned that there were others like me, people who yearn for steady routines, repeated patterns, and a few cherished subjects, the driftwood that keeps us afloat. The syndrome was identified in 1944 by Hans Asperger, a Viennese pediatrician who wrote, for success in science or art, a dash of autism is essential. In Asperger's syndrome, a guide for parents and professionals, Tony Atwood observed, the person with Asperger's syndrome has no distinguishing physical features, but is primarily viewed by other people as different because of their unusual quality of social behavior and conversation skills. For example, a woman with Asperger's syndrome described how as a child, she saw people moving into the house up the street, ran up to one of the new kids, and instead of the conventional greeting and request of, hi, you want to play, proclaimed, nine times nine is equal to 81. Um, uh, and um, I think I'm going to let the book be at this point, uh, just to say that I wrote the, uh, the piece in The New Yorker at the strong suggestion of David Remnick, who's the editor-in-chief there, and we talked about it at one point back as far as about 2004 when I was newly married and very happy and uh, sort of, uh, you know, didn't necessarily want to go through all my past all over again, and I said, well, I'm, I'm interested, in, but I, I don't know if I'm going to do it right now. In any event, David uh, contacted me at the Washington Post when I was really, really tired of being a music critic, which I'd been for really almost 30 years at that point, and uh, my marriage had just broken up, and uh, he asked me to come to, uh, to New York and have lunch with him, and paid my way up, and I had a really nice lunch. And then uh, he, he kept saying, you've got to work on this piece. You've got to work on this piece. So I worked on the piece, and I was very anxious about it. And I had a few people tell me, you can't possibly publish this. Um, and I said, well, I really want to. I, I, I said, you know, uh, as I say in the beginning of the book, you know, I'm in my mid-50s, and I really can't be embarrassed for too long, you know. So... Uh, I, I started to work on the piece, and I published it, and um, it, it, was, it was really sort of extraordinary. I, I all of a sudden got just a remarkable response from people out there, probably pretty close to 1,000 emails, letters, um, comments here and there, and uh, I've never regretted it. And uh, it, it, um, I, 
and so anyway, they asked me to go ahead with the book, and uh, so I just decided that I, I didn't want to do the thing where I went back and looked at my life and said, you know, every page or two, well, I did that because I had Asperger's, or, you know, of course I understood this because I had Asperger's, or of course I was afraid of this because I had Asperger's. So the Asperger's syndrome sort of goes away in the middle of the book, but it's, I, I think it's ever-present because, you know, it was a huge influence on my life, and, uh, uh, but, but I didn't want to overdo just writing about Asperger's. First of all, I'm not a, a, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not somebody who can tell you from the outside all sorts of things that you should do with Asperger's. Indeed, I have to say, I don't really even know that much about Asperger's, except I have it. So, um, but, uh, uh, so, so I also felt that I, I didn't want to just keep going back and forth and talking about it. Uh, but I wanted to, to, to write about how things seemed to me at the time, and I thought that would be a whole lot better than just coming down and saying exactly what um, I now believe was the case. So what I've tried to do in the book is capture some of the, the sad points, some of the happier points, some of the things that have shaped me, which I actually think are genuinely a gift from Asperger's rather than a challenge from Asperger's, and uh, just write about my childhood. So the book is basically the first 20 years of my life when nobody knew what the heck was wrong with me at all, except that I seemed to be very, very good at some things and really completely hopeless at most things. Uh, and then, then there's a sort of wrap-up chapter at the end where I, I, I talk a little bit more about where I am now, um, you know, what I've, what I've done with my life somewhat, um, and, uh, and, you know, going on from there. So anyway, it's out, and um, uh, it's, it's, it's funny because I still have, you know, some members of my family and people like that who are saying, like, you know, how, how can you talk about this stuff? And I don't know, it just seems to me, or, or, or if I have different attitudes towards some things. And it, it seemed to me that the most important thing with a book like this, and in fact, the only thing that justifies a book like this is to be as honest as you can be. And, you know, everybody misremembers at some point, and everybody, you know, will have certain, you know, moments of vanity which will keep them from expressing entirely how awful or degrading or horrible or, 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 or something, something was. Um, but I've, I've done my best to be honest in it, and I, I, I guess I just hope that uh, um, those of you who, who read the book... Um, We'll, we'll find maybe some, if, if not help, because in no way is it one of those, here's how to get by with Asperger's syndrome book, because I, I have no, no gift for that. But it, I, I hope maybe some of the stuff will be sympathetic to you, and I hope that maybe some of the story might, might be helpful to some of you who are you know, undergoing your own struggles, those of you who have Asperger's syndrome, or those of you who are just trying to support somebody else. And believe me, I, I would say that one, I would say that the, the things which have been really most important to me in my life have been certain people in my family and my very dear friends, you know, who always understood me, you know, recognized, you know, that maybe sometimes I'd be a little bit different, but, you know, recognized other things about me that I'd be, you know, pretty loyal and um, I'd, I'd, you know, do my best not to be um, too harmful or uh, anyway it's uh, it's a book it's um, I, I've, I've read a number of, of autism memoirs and uh, many of them are I, I mean all of them are courageous um, many of them are also terrific but none of them had really quite told my story so I decided this was my moment to tell my story and I've tried to tell it and uh, I'm going to sit down now. I'm going to uh, take this and the book and sit in this chair, and I'm happy to answer. Let me see if I can do this without causing some horrible squeak, which happened to me in Santa Monica the other night. Um, I, I have sort of bad feet these days, so I hope you don't mind if I sit here. And if anyone has any questions, uh, if, if you give me the question, I will repeat it back to the best of my ability and then uh, um, try to answer it. And uh, there's a gentleman right down there, and then, then you. Are you still working for the Post? 
Uh, the question is if I'm still working for the Washington Post. I am, but only as a freelancer. I, I, I can write anywhere I want now. Um, and uh, I like that. My, my, my job at this point is I'm a professor of journalism and music at the University of Southern California. So I'm in Los Angeles uh, for about eight months a year. Rest of the time I'm in Baltimore or, you know, in, in New York where a couple of my, my kids are at least a lot of the time. But, uh, yeah, no, I, 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 I took what, uh, what all reporters will recognize uh, if I say I took the buyout. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. highly skilled, that social skills matter immensely, even in the computer and the software world where I work. And so when I think of in, institutions like the New York Times and the New Yorker, I, don't, I don't, haven't heard your story yet, and I don't know enough about your social skills, but I'm wondering how, if you have those social skills problems, how you were able to contain positions at such a best Sure. Uh, the, 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 I, I'll, I'll do my best to do justice to the question. The question was um, that uh, workplaces demand a lot of social skills, and, and she asked me uh, how I managed to work at the New York Times and the New Yorker. Um, two answers. Um, uh, the New Yorker, I didn't work at all. I've, I've only met David Remnick and my immediate editor. This was just something I could type at 3 o'clock in the morning, chewing my fingernails and you know, going a little crazy in my room, and then they printed it. So that was great. As for the New York Times, it's the most awful place in the world to work, or it's one of them, certainly. Um, I think some of my Globe friends might you know, ag agree with that, since the uh, New York Times has not been exactly kind to the Boston Globe. Um, but uh, uh, I don't think I did much worse than most other people. It was a very competitive, tough place to work. I, I finally reached a point, because I worked at the Times from when I was about 26 to about 31. Um, and I was the lowest on every possible totem pole. Um, and they, they basically just sent me to cover concerts, and then I would cover the concert and just write it up and disappear. So, I mean, I was a complete misfit there. I was a misfit at Newsday and a misfit at the Washington Post. But um, at the times, it was very tough because there, there wasn't a lot of sympathy for much of anybody. Newsday, and especially the Washington Post, and especially the Washington Post when Catherine Graham was working there, uh, tried very hard to be as familial a place as possible, and if they recognized that you didn't do well in a room with lots of people and phones ringing, they let you work at home. And so, uh, uh, I, I, you know, I, I have absolutely nothing negative to say about the Washington Post. It was a wonderful place to work, and I, I have friends who like working at the New York Times. It, it, it wasn't an easy place for me. On the other hand, it was also a time when the the Times was under you know particularly difficult uh, editor. Although I guess worse work to come. So um, that 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 well, well, it was Abe Rosenthal, but he was also a brilliant editor. Um, but uh, yeah, I see some other hands. Yes, Josh, how are you? I went to Columbia with Josh. My, my friend Josh Passell, uh, who I knew at Columbia um, a, a while back, um, said that I was very kind to him when he was at Columbia and we were at the radio station there together, which was a pretty crazy bureaucracy there, too. Um, I, I, I think, um, I mean, I can only address it um, as, as far as you. I mean, you were, you, you were an extremely smart kid. You had the same sort of intense interest in classical music, which if you'd pushed me a little bit, you might have found was one of about three things I could talk about in the world. <laughs> um, and I also, especially by the time I got to Columbia, I'd started meditating, which, which took away a lot of the anxiety that I'd always felt when I was younger. Um, and um, I also, you know, I always wanted to be a nice and, and, and generous person, but I had to learn it, you know, the same way people have to learn a language. Um, I mean, I, I was 
pretty well disposed towards the world. I, I certainly wasn't really misanthropic. Um, and I especially liked people who were smart and would talk about music because, as I say, it was, it, you know, that really was a language um, that, I, that I could relate in. Um, but, uh, you know, a, a heck of a lot of, of dealing with the world with Asperger's syndrome is, um, and I, I, I don't want this to sound hypocritical because I, I don't mean it in that way, and I don't ma- want to make it sound like I don't have feelings because I do, but, you know, you, you, you sort of learn a kind of mimicry. I mean, everybody does it to some extent. Everybody learns how to act cool or, or get through things. And I had to just learn how to not interrupt and not, you know, be, um, be particularly aggressive and how to just kind of channel my, my behavior into, into something that was considered polite. I, I found discovering Emily Post's book on etiquette incredibly helpful because it explained to me why people were the way they were. And I guess by that point I'd gotten a lot better at it. But, you know, if you'd met me five, ten years before, I, I don't think I would have been as, as good at being polite, although I think I would have liked you just as much. Does that help? <laughs> okay. Yes, back there. Yeah. Um, the, the the question was, can I describe what it was like being married? And I, I, I'll I'll do my best. There are other people involved with this, and I want to be, you know, as as cautious as I can be. Um, uh, my my first marriage was to one of my best friends in the world, um, and it seemed to me that we I was at an age, and she was at an age where we should um, get married because that's what you do when you're in your late twenties if you want to have children which we both did, um, and if you'd been sort of together for a long time. And we had a very up-and-down relationship because I was not good at, um, you know, close, you know, in- intense personal relations at that point at all. Um, and it was, you know, it was back and forth. It was, it was, a, it, 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 it was a tough time. Um, but we had three kids. I was delighted. Um, the marriage has remained a terrific friendship, but it couldn't really last as a marriage. And I think it was basically two friends trying to have a marriage, uh, and that doesn't always work. Um, my second marriage was very different. I, I fell in love with somebody who was absolutely as different from me as humanly possible and fell absolutely head over heels and was exhilarated. And I had about three years of, you know, what I, what I can say without any... Um, you know, with, with, I, I can say without it being um, just one of those cliches that it was really wedded bliss for a while. Um, but I guess it wasn't that much because um, uh, she she had to leave and she left and she was very kind about it and extremely decent. Um, and she remained somebody I love a lot. But, uh, you know, I felt like somebody had backed up the car in me maybe 15 times, you know. Um, uh, I survived. Um, I'm still going. Um, I'm incredibly grateful for the experience. I don't know if it'll ever happen again. Um, I was reading something that Hemingway said a while back, which is if you've really ever been in love, the rest of the world after that is, is strangely dead. Um, and I felt that for a long time. I'm feeling a little bit better now. I, I was extremely lucky that I had this book to channel things into. First the article, then the book. Because um, one, one thing that I've been extremely lucky at just to begin with, uh, because, I mean, I, I make no secrets of my moods and my anxiety and my depression. If you read the book, you'll learn all about it, and it's not that thrilling. But um, if, if I'm going, if I'm falling through lots of water and just about to drown, I have some weird kind of twitch with my toe that the second I touch bottom, it sends me shooting up again. So if I hadn't had this book and hadn't had something to throw myself into, beyond telling you what you know, last night's performance of the Dvorak Fifth under Leonard Slatkin was, um, you know, that might have really ended it. But fortunately, I, I, I mean, I guess all my life, whenever I've been miserable, I turn to something and I work on it. And I would say that... Um, you know, I, I guess I work best when my heart is broken. When I, was, when I was actually married for those three or four years, I only did one book. And for me, that's a major slowdown. 
I, I still, you know, I, given my druthers, I'm sorry it ended. But, uh, but you know, I'm extremely fond of my both of my former wives, and I hope that helps. Yes. How do you feel that your interest in music relates to Asperger's syndrome in particular? Oh, okay. The, the the question was, how do I feel my interest in music relates to Asperger's syndrome, if at all? Um, I, here here again, it, it, it's really tough. I mean, I'll, I'll try to answer you, and I'll try to answer you as directly as possible. Um, I think it actually has a lot to do with, with it. Um, I think um, for me, when my mom made the conscious or unconscious decision to let me ruin all of her records when I was two or three and just sit there and watch the record going around and learn what all the bands were on each side of the record and turn it over and, you know, scratch it and turn the, the thing up to 78 and listen to it there and then put on a 78 record or play a 78 record at 33. You know, it was that wonderful time where there were 33s, 45s, and 78s. And, you know, I was just this kid and, my you know, I couldn't nap from the beginning. But I, I have to say that at two or three, I didn't understand or know as much consciously about music as I do now. But it was obvious to me that it was something profound and beautiful and that I actually felt at home in its world. Uh, and, you know, I, I was, I, I mean, for me, it was just something that I understood, you know, as, you know I'm talking as a three-year-old, uh, as much as, as I could. And I, I just gave to it. And it just, uh, it just thrilled me and it comforted me. And I, I can remember listening to music and then listening to people talk and just thinking, you know, what are they doing? It's just gas in the air, you know? It's, it has nothing to do with anything important or, or valuable. Um, you know, I got better at the talking stuff. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, for, 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 for me, the music was just, um, I mean, it was, it was a blessing. And it, it still is, you know? I, 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 I was talking with Richard, and I was saying earlier tonight that I don't go to many concerts because I, you know, I probably covered three or four thousand of them over the years. But I still listen to music at home and um, it still moves me um, really beyond practically anything else in the world. And I, I do think that the Asperger's syndrome has something to do with my understanding, although I can't really tell you more than that. Yes? Uh, could, could you speak up just? My son, um, who has NPLT, which is very similar to Asperger's, um, also started off with an obsession with music age two, the same thing you, as you put with CDs. And he's gone on with this obsession with music. When does it get, when is he going to find someone that he can share that with? Because all he wants to do at the same is talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. How, at, he's now 11, but still, is it at high school they find, you found someone that would talk to and listen and share that interest? What age did you find? Sure. And to make friends with people. Uh, 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 her, her son um, is about 11 years old, and he's been obsessed and fascinated by music um, since he was about the same age that I got fascinated by it. And she, she was asking me um, what age I really started to find people who, um, who, who shared that obsession. Um, not many people... I, I grew up on a college campus. I grew up at UConn. Um, and... Fortunately, the person who understood my obsession was the woman who was in charge of the music library. And I could walk to the music library, and that's what I would do every night. Uh, you know, uh, it was close enough to the campus. It was a pretty safe area. Um, and um, I would just go up there, and I'd just listen to all the music I wanted and read all I wanted. And I think my friends thought I was kind of strange. My brothers certainly did. There's the, uh, my, my brother I used to take up to the music library on Saturday mornings when he was about six and I was about 10. Uh, and he told me in adulthood that he used to wonder when he was a six-year-old when he'd grow up and want to do this with his weekends. <laughs> um, I, I would say when I really got to know people like that, it was when I went to Tanglewood. I went there as a 15-year-old student and, um, you know, I could just talk with people all evening. Um, uh, it, it, it was often a lot of composers and a lot of pianists who were the who are, in general, the ones who are most interested in just weird things that was going on in the music. And we, we understood each other immediately. I actually have this theory, though, that a lot of people with Asperger's syndrome, if you've ever seen the film The Shining, 
And early in the film, there's this little kid and there's, there's this elderly black man and they start talking to each other and, and the, the, the guy says, you know, you've got the shining, you know, we understand each other, you know, and they couldn't be more different. He's this kind of, you know, kid just brought up to the hotel and the other, the other guy has been working there for years and years, but they recognize that they have a shining. Uh, and I would say that's what happened with me with a lot of my friends. I would just understand. I would go so far as to say that, you know, I, I had a friendship with Glenn Gould, um, and he was supposedly this very difficult, very impossible to talk to guy up in Canada. And, you know, the moment we started talking, it was just, you know, four hours would go by because we understood each other in some, some funny way. So I would just say, you know, as much as you can, try to... Um, you know, try to try to let them meet people who are interested in music. Um, not someone who's going to tell him what to listen to. Not somebody who's going to smack his wrists, but people who he can just share his excitement. And you know, they can throw out some other ideas in there too. But if if he's like I was, he probably is pretty sure what he thinks already. Uh, yes, I see a hand back there. I see two. We'll do two. Oh gosh, um, uh, I like classical music. What's my opinion on ragtime? I like it. It's never interested me that much. Um, um, it, 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 it's. I mean, I, I pretty much am kind of interested in, in a lot of music, but it's 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 not something that did that much for me personally. I I got very interested in Scott Joplin around the time of the Sting, um, like like the rest of the world, um, and I I always listened to it with pleasure. But uh, it, it wasn't my particular thing. My particular thing was old opera, um, music that repeated a lot, um, uh, and a few other things. I, I like very claustrophobic rock and roll. I like the Velvet Underground and Captain Beefheart and this very intense, kind of aggressive, repetitive music. Um, so, um, but, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm all for ragtime. Yes, sir. Hey, Bill, how are you? to see you. Gosh, this is old, old time week. <laughs> um, and I just have to say offhand that I was always fascinated by you. You were, we were very good friends, of course, but everything you were interested in, I seem to have picked up the old opera, things like that. So I never suspected. I, I, I don't have Asperger's, but similar interests. But I emailed you and I said that my nephew has the nonverbal learning disorder. And I have two questions about that. Sure. Um, one of them is that as you physically mature from teenage until whatever, and I know you read the Emily Post to take cues from there, but did you find any difference that uh, maturing physically ameliorated some of your symptoms or anything of that nature? Well, the, 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 the question was whether physical maturity helped ameliorate some of my symptoms. I would say it did in two different ways. Number one was the onset of puberty, and I really, really wanted women to like me. So I realized that maybe the best way of doing that was not putting my leg behind my head and rocking back and forth. And, you know, I, 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 I sort of learned that I was going to have to calm myself down a bit and try to be... Fortunately, it was a time when the whole hippie thing was going on, so I could still sort of allow some of my strangenesses to flower, and they'd be, they'd be treated as a little bit, you know, as if I was you know, part of the, the, the avant-garde or something. But the, the other thing, which I think is actually more serious and which I would hope is helpful to some of the, the, the parents out here and the kids, um, uh, is that once you've gone around the block a few times, a few hundred times, a few thousand times, it's not going to be quite so awful as it was. Um, you know, if, if somebody takes something away from you or, you know, says you're an idiot or makes fun of you or something like that, you don't, in fact, have to go into full-blown tantrum. And after a while, you don't really even care. So I would say that by the time I met you, and I met Bill when I was about 21, 22, and we were at the Manus College of Music together, by the time I met you, I was already beginning to settle down. One thing which I will plug again, is that a hugely important thing for me was learning how to meditate because it taught me when I was about to have a complete and total panic attack that there, I, I could s sort of close my eyes and just calm myself down a little bit. And that was 
enormously helpful to me. So, so that's something I'll Bill, did you have a follow-up? Okay, what, yeah. huge in your life, of course. And my nephew, uh, he didn't get fixated on that. I, this is not unusual to children. He's fixated on computer games. Yeah. Possibly in a way more intensely than normal kids. But that's hard for yeah. Uh, but he uses it as a social thing. In other words, he uses it, the, the kids at school, because of his uh, shortcomings in social uh, situations, he uses it as a way to make friends. Sure. Was, well, how would you react to that aspect? No, he didn't get fixated on music. Is, is it just something that you might get fixated on something else, and that's a substitute? I, the, 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 I, I think I. Yeah. Uh, um, he, uh, Bill, Bill was mentioning that um, he has a relative who is fixated on, on video games, computer, and that that's sort of a social thing. Um, I, I actually, um, you know, I, I would think that that would be. Uh, I mean. I think that with a lot of Aspie kids, any fixation is a blessing. I mean, obviously, so long as it's not some kind of horrible, you know, antisocial thing, you know, setting fires or, you know, something like that. I mean, then you have to have a talk. But, um, yeah, well, it's not even so much an escape. It's, it's, a, it's, it's an ability to take this kind of exhaustive and, in some cases, exhausting personality and just throw it into something. I mean, some of the, um, I, I know some kids with Asperger's syndrome who I really worry about, and they're the ones who actually haven't found something that they really love and that they can obsess on and worry about and, and concentrate on. Uh, for me, it was an incredible help to have these, these unusual um, things that I could really, really get involved in, whether they were silent film, whether they were... Um, uh, you know, historical things, statistics, you know, I mean, it's helpful. It's, it's a real release to be able to use this kind of strange, intense, obsessive gift and find something that you can make your own. And I've, I've been very lucky that I was able to find that and do it. So, yes, sir. I think we only have time for two or three more, but I'll be at the reception afterwards. I'm interested in um, the impact your Asperger's on your writing abilities. Uh, to confess, I'm a doctoral student in your department at USC right now. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so, uh, given the fact that the proclivity in Asperger's for detail, and the fact that in dealing with writing about music, you're dealing with simultaneous events that can become very detailed, did you find it difficult, especially in the beginning when you started your writing career, to parse out some of the detail and focus on, you know, the... A big picture. The big picture. Yeah. Um, the question is about learning how to write about music. And, uh, you know, you know I, I think I got better about writing about music as I did it more, but I, I have to say, for me, it was kind of almost like a synesthesia. Mu music suggested words and suggested you know, feelings and places and thoughts. And, you know, and when, when, I, when I later learned, you know, sonata form and, you know, chords and modes and things like that, I, I, could, I could somehow manage, as I probably couldn't have when I was a kid, to um, work them into my, my sort of palette. Um, uh, but, but for me, there really wasn't much difficulty. My problem is, strangely enough, I don't, I don't really have much of a visual gift. I can have lunch with somebody and not remember what clothes they were wearing, or um, I think I'd remember if they weren't wearing clothes. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and, you know, forget about all those things. Um, but, but music is just something which sort of follows me around. For me, talking about music is just not very difficult. I, I'm terrible with plot descriptions, when I have to do a movie or something like that or anything that demands, I mean, I'm good at reporting if I'm actually reporting, but if I'm trying to do a critique of a book or of a film, that's a lot harder for me because um, um, I'm more comfortable in sensation, I guess, than I am with, uh, with actual um, uh, just uh, depiction, uh, if that makes any sense. I, yes, yes, and, and yes. 
Uh, oh, three, okay. You, you first in the, uh, in the reddish shirt. I think it's red. <laughs> yeah, um, I teach, and so do you. What strategies have you used as a college professor that are the most effective? Um, I'm Asperger's as well. Ah, okay. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a teacher, she's a teacher, and she asked me what effects, I, uh, what, what techniques I've used. Basically, what I love to do is take somebody's work and try to make it stronger. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I teach grad students mostly, so I, I'm, I'm dealing with people who've done this for a while. Unfortunately, I'm not in a disciplinarian situation, which I think I'd be really wretched at. Um, uh, but uh, what I like to do is I like to take people's writings, have them read them aloud, try to um, judge them uh, as, as logical statements, as uh, little pieces of poetry, as um, perhaps as music, if they really do a good job, and then just talk about that and go back. I mean, I, 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 make, I don't think I'd make a very good lecturer. I, I do much better when I, I'm working with people and getting their input and giving some of my own back. And I always try to do that really in pretty much a collegial sense. I mean, I'll correct factual errors or grammatical errors, but aside from that, I just, I'm, I, I, I tell people now that I'm more interested in what my students say about a work of art than I am in actually often experiencing the work of art myself. And I'm interested in helping them find their way to express their truth about that art while not making factual errors. So it's a little complicated. Yes, I saw somebody right over. Was that somebody? I think so, maybe. Okay, you said um, when you were in second grade that you spent recess inside. Yeah. And when you're a music critic, you get to be alone. Is there a connection there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I, I got to spend time alone in second grade studying the encyclopedia. And then as a music critic, yeah, you spend your time alone. I mean, I would be in a really terrible situation if I had to deal with strangers constantly. I mean, it put me behind a counter and you'd have a basket case in an hour or two. I, I, I had a brief year, well, it wasn't brief, it was a very long year, uh, at, at the St. Louis Symphony where I was actually trying to run an orchestra and deal with all the different egos and sensibilities involved. They were very nice people. I'm not, I'm not remotely knocking it, or the orchestra, which is a great one. But um, I was utterly terrible at it. I couldn't, you know, read body language. You know, someone would ask me a question and it would strike me as really absurd and I'd say that. And, you know, um, uh, we, we, we had one... Um, one very rich donor who, um, who, who sat down and told me that the way to solve our financial problems was to put Ravel's Bolero in every program. Um, and I laughed in her face, and I thought she was joking, and she wasn't. <laughs> anyway, that was, that was not a great moment. There was a, right there, yes. Um, I, I was asked about my meditation. Um, I don't have any particularly um, profound things to say. I, I, I do transcendental meditation. I've been doing it since 1975. They, they had an introductory course for $60 back then. They charged something like $2,000, $3,000 now. Um, I'm not involved in the movement. I'm not, uh, I don't consider myself really... Um, I consider myself, I guess, somewhat spiritual, but certainly not religious in any way. Um, and uh, I guess what happened to me was it was just, uh, it, it sounded like a way of escaping from myself and escaping from the world and having some silence and some deep relaxation. And it was extraordinary for me because I was in a terrible accident, which is mentioned in this book, when I was about 17, which had me completely even more of a wreck than usual. Two people died, and I was, um, I was just really destroyed by it. And for at least, I, more or less since childhood, I'd always sort of been like this. But after the accident, for a while, I was just always like this. I, I, I sort of walked like Boris Karloff in, in Frankenstein. And the thing, the thing that happened with meditation was I was constantly having panic attacks. 
I went in for meditation and I just started doing the mantra and my shoulders dropped just like that. You know, I couldn't have done it by myself if somebody had come in and say, now relax this and relax this. But here I am, you know, just sitting in a room um, and just with my eyes shut and my shoulders dropped. And um, it was incredible for me. I mean, it was, you know, I, I still do it twice every day and it's incredibly helpful. But it's odd. I've never been interested in learning more. I, I, you know, it, it didn't make me really very more spiritual. It didn't, certainly didn't get me interested in the TM movement. Um, I just found it a marvelous and helpful technique. And for those of you who are working with Asperger's syndrome, for, forget the stuff about flying and all the stuff that they tried to put out for a while. But um, some kind of meditation, I think, is, is very definitely going to be helpful for a lot of people with, with, with Asperger's syndrome. Putting aside all religion, whatever religion you know, somebody's in, interested in, and I know some Asperger people who are very, very religious, um, but the technique itself of just being able to quiet yourself and just, you know, instead of having a tantrum, instead of letting that tantrum go to its end, just sit by yourself and, um, and sort of calm yourself uh, has been absolutely invaluable to me. Invaluable. I, I cannot imagine my life without it the last 30, 34 years. What do you say to yourself? I, I'm not supposed to say that. And for, for whatever strange reasons, I'm still not giving out my mantra. Um, I, I'm, I'm told, and I don't know whether this is true or not, but I'm told if you do give out a mantra, it's no good for the person because you haven't gone through the other stuff. So I'm not, I'm not trying to be selfish here, but it's, it's one either belief or superstition or whatever you want to say that I, uh, it's, it's just something I haven't done. And, you know, it probably doesn't matter at all. Apparently Brian Wilson, who's a big meditator, was on the Dick Cavett show or something. He says, well, you're not supposed to say your mantra, but mine is. And he said it, you know, in front of all these millions of people. But I don't know if it would work, you know? I mean, they, they must have some system for getting this. I would think that there's, there, there should be some way of starting some kind of meditation. You couldn't call it TM because TM is a, is a trademark. But there must be some way of teaching meditation where you don't have to charge people $2,000. I just don't get it, you know? When it was 60 bucks, that was one thing. Now that it's 2,000 bucks, that's a, that's a big chunk of change. I mean, I would still say that it was very much worth all that to me, but you know, I mean, it's a, it's a lot of money. So I can take one more. Yeah, the, back there. I'm watching you right now, and I am overwhelmed. I think you are an incredible speaker. Thank you. Um, I, I hear what you were talking about when you were younger and what you went through. But when I look at you right now, you're here with 200 people answering questions in such an eloquent way. And I want to know, could you have done this when you were 25 years old? The, 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 thank you, first of all, for the, the compliments. Uh, um, she, she said I was an eloquent, eloquent speaker. <laughs> Um, eloquent speaker and whether I could have done it at 25. Um, I had a rather unusual father, uh, and this is also in the book, who took me to his classes when I was four and five because, you know, he, he was interested in educating gifted kids. And he was kind of a strange guy. He actually, I wasn't allowed to call him dad. I had to pretend that his, he was Dr. Page. And, but I got very good at thinking on my feet about things that are going through me. Now, if, if you come back to the meeting afterwards, I have about two or three reactions I can do when I'm, when I'm talking in an unstructured situation. But this sort of thing doesn't bother me. I, I, in, in a weird way, I've sort of got this act down. I mean, it's not really an act. I'm telling you the honest truth about myself, but I'm used to talking about, um, about these things, whereas... If I'm, if I'm sitting there, and I'm, or God, if I'm at a party, um, and I don't know anybody there and don't know what my, what my duties are supposed to be, I mean, I'm, I'm what, what the, the kids call a shoegazer. Um, and, you know, I'm out of there pretty fast. But th this sort of thing I'm pretty comfortable in. And I think part of it's the fact that I've done it since I was a kid. And I think part of it is the fact that I, you know, I... You know, I probably wouldn't have been able to talk about so many personal things. But, you know, once you've written a memoir and you put all your, you know, quirks out there for people to see, you know, you can't, you know, you can't really take it back. <laughs> so. Listen, thank you all very much. I really appreciate your company. And I'll, I'll, I'll see you back at the, uh, you know, back there.
Thank you.